Now we're going to have uh, Rosemary talking to you again. And I loved your point about daily weighing of animals. Uh, when I was working at the RSPCA in New South Wales as a vet quite a few years ago now, I adopted a, an overweight mouse whose name I didn't choose, Mr. Stinky. Um, and because he was overweight, I needed to weigh him. So I went to a kitchen shop to get some scales so I could weigh things in grams. And I went and I said, I need to weigh things in grams. Uh, it's a mouse, and they were like, oh, yeah, is it just, hmm. And then I got a guinea pig, and I went back to the same kitchen shop, and I said, I need to weigh things in kilograms. And they said, gee, your business is booming. Um, but it was actually for weighing guinea pigs, so there you go. Anyway, I'd like to introduce now uh, Rosemary Crawford, who's going to talk about, from fearful to friendly, taming those tiny tigers, and she's got some tiny tigers of her own by the looks. <laughs> Thank you. Set up here. There's one tiny tiger. Here's a tinier tiny tiger. Where's my clicker? There we go. Okay. Hi again, everyone. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> yeah. You know this already? We're a nonprofit. Yada yada yada. Good. Okay. Oops. There we go. So, um, tiny, taming tiny tigers. I still do not have any coffee between the last session and this one, so we'll, we'll see what we get here. Um, I, this is one of my favorite things. I'm going to put this here. Because most of the kittens I tend to foster are the medical kittens, the really, really sick panleukopenia kittens, the, the ones that hour by hour you're not sure they're going to still be with us, which luckily most of the time they are. Um, so, sometimes. If those of you have done bottle, bi bottle babies and you keep doing bottle babies and sometimes you're like, God, I just need some sleep. I need to not have to check on my patient every couple hours. Taming a tiny tiger is just the most fun thing. They're, they are robust. They are usually strong. They, sometimes you're a little bit happy when they get a little bit of upper respiratory infection so you can kind of calm them down a little bit and work with them a little easier. But um, it's just an emotional, it's, it's fun for me. So I hope it will be fun for you if you haven't considered taming tiny tigers before. Um, maybe this will open up a chance for you. So we're going to look at some key factors involved with taming these little guys. Uh, by providing their appropriate environments to get them feeling safe, get them feeling confident, get them to come out of their shell and start interacting positively with humans. We're going to talk about some pot positive protocols that really seem to make a difference, um, really easy but practical. Um, pitfalls to the progress and what do you do when it just seems like a kitten isn't progressing. Um, and then of course, and really maybe this should have been at the front of it, is the safety for everyone involved. Um, we need to make sure that our caregivers are safe, and we also, of course, need to make sure that the animals that we're caring for are safe in this entire process. So some factors affecting success. Nature versus nurture. Each animal is different. Even animals from the same litter will act very different. Um, and I love this picture here. Even at this age, so they're like about four weeks old, little ears are up, Eyes are still blue, kind of hard to see in the picture. But even at this age, their little personalities are kind of developing. And you got the one in the middle like, yeah, hey, what's going on? And the other guy, the, the, the gray guy next to him, kind of OK. And the third one back there is just kind of sitting there like a lump. <laughs> he's he's going to be like just the lump kitty later on. <laughs> Don't care one way or the other, human, not human, whatever. Uh, but then you got the one in back going, I'm going to stay behind. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that it's really safe for me. You guys go check it out. I'm staying back here. Um, happily, all of these guys were wonderfully transformed. So the next thing that we also have to consider with taming tiny tigers, um, and of course with the nature and nurture, sometimes, especially animals who have been like tw 10, 12, 15th generation feral kitties, it may be um, starting to get into their nature as well. Um, so not every kitten is going to be transformable, but many will be, and especially if we look at the age of their first socialization attempts and their first interactions with humans and other animals. Uh, and there's a socialization period, which is from about two weeks to two months. And that is your optimal time to be able to tame these little guys. 
There used to be hard and fast rules, and sometimes there still are in shelters, especially shelters which are really overrun um, with the number of animals that are coming into them all the time, where they just had to set hard and fast rules and said if it's over, if a kitten's over eight weeks, it goes back out. Um, prior to TNR programs, it was if it's over eight weeks, it didn't have a chance and it didn't have a live outcome. So thankfully that is changing as well. So that's not to say that kittens older than two months old can't be socialized. And, and many are. Uh, it just might take a little bit more time. Case in point, there, was, uh, there were some feral cats living in an area where we were living. And, uh, and so, you know, you start feeding them. And if you feed them, you got to fix them. So that means you get, well, at least you don't have to, but ethically, you know, if you're going to feed them, we don't want them reproducing. So um, back in the States, it is not illegal to trap them and get them fixed um, and desexed. So we trapped these kitties. There were four. And the longer you do this, the more you're going to be able to tell if there's that kernel in them. Like, they want to be loved. They want to trust. They're kind of, I, I kind of want to trust you, human being, but I don't know. So anyway, we trapped these kitties. They were about five months old. Two, I knew right away, like they were, they were a handful. <laughs> they were, they didn't want to be transformed. They have a lovely life on a farm with an air-conditioned barn yet. So um, those guys went out there. But there were two, the other two were kind of like, you know, there is just something about these two. And so I started working with them. And yeah, I adopted them. <laughs> and I used to say, so again, they're five months old, and you know, take some time. And, and these same techniques I'm going to talk about today, I used with these kitties, and I ended up keeping them. My intention was to put them to adoption, and and I went to some adoption events, and they were the, the two that I kept were really bonded brother and sister. You know, if they were out of sight with each other, they kind of did this little panic thing, and and some people were interested in one cat and not the other. I was like, oh, I can't separate them, so they just kind of made their way to more and more rooms in our house, and eventually there they were, <laughs> living in our house. So anyway, this, the one kitty, um, there's a black male, and a tortie, tortoise shell. And the, the tortoise shell, I used to say, maybe someday she'll trust me enough to sit next to me on the couch. Well, she is now, my husband says that she's more loyal than a dog. If we are sitting anywhere, she is sitting on me, and not on my lap, but like on me here. And she sleeps with me every night, and I can even pill her. I'm the only one who can pill her, but um, she's she's certainly come around. And she was a good five months old when when she was trapped. It's just a matter of how much time you have, and and if you can see that kernel in there that they that they have it. And again, you will get more and more familiar with that the more you do this. Um, so back to what what works and what doesn't work. Previous experiences. Now, if these cats that I trapped had um, had really, really bad human experiences to start, they might not have been willing to come around. And who knows? Maybe those two that were like, you know, really handful. Maybe they did have really bad experiences. I don't know. But um, when they have the experiences, what age they are when they have those experiences, and if they are good or bad experiences with humans or with with uh, other animals, that can really affect if they're going to come around and how long it might take them to come around. And so that's the time available. There's a, if, if you're going to tame tiny tigers, sometimes um, you know your shelters and rescues are full. How much time the kittens are allowed before you start to see improvement and make a decision one way or the other if they're going to go back out where they were trapped um, and be in a managed colony, or if they're going to continue being socialized and eventually go up to adoption. And the other aspect about the time available is how much time available does your staff or do your volunteers have? If you put these kittens in a cage and you do not interact with them, they are not going to come around, period. So you have to do a lot of interaction. You have to have a lot of volunteer and staff involvement. So let's set the stage for success. When we first bring these little guys in, um, what are we going to do for them? So of course they need to have a safe, quiet, and contained environment. And I have some pictures here of some various boxes. There's a feral cat box that you know, you can put a, a clear cover on the front and be able to transport them a little bit more easily and they can still use it as a hiding place. There are these cardboard um, boxes, these little 
castles that you can kind of turn into the box that they go home in. There's a little perch on the top. They can still hide underneath. These are nice because for disinfecting, you can just you know throw them out, um, but it can get a bit expensive. Um, on the bottom is actually for rodents, um, guinea pigs, ferrets, and it's a little igloo. And I don't, you can't really tell very well from the picture, but it's a little um, transparent. And that's great because one, it, you can disinfect it pretty easily. You know, you can completely submerge it in, in some disinfectant and get all the nooks and crannies. Um, but also that transparency a little bit, the kittens feel secure, but you can kind of still see in there and see what's going on pretty easily without having to disturb them. So there's all kinds of options, um, even plastic boxes at, you know, at stores where you buy supplies for, for humans um, or cardboard boxes that your things come in. Give them a little hidey spot. Of course, set them up with food and water or their litter and their bedding. Um, the litter, if we can have it at least three feet away from the food, very nice. Um, again, UC Davis, wonderful resource. If you go to their site, they have information about how to turn cage banks into um, like multiple cages for the single animals by putting those portholes in them. So they can go between two sections, have a litter on one side, your food and, and your bedding on the other side. And uh, plus it's really good for if you have kittens with a, a really feral mama cat, or even in the beginning when the kittens are still very feral, if they're you know the, the eight weeks, 10 week old kittens, um, it's nice to have that ability to close a porthole in between, clean up one side, scoot them to the other side, clean up the other side, and not really have to do too much of stressful handling for the kitties. Um, stress, so there's where also pheromones and lighting can come in. There's sprays like Feel Away and, and um, Comfort um, sprays that um, are, are good cat pheromones to help calm them. You can put that, you can spray those in the, their environment before the cats, the kittens are put in there. Don't, um, there's an alcohol base to it, so do it you know, half hour or so if you can before putting the cats in there so the pheromones are there but the alcohol has been able to evaporate away. And likewise, um, some nice soft mood lighting for these guys. Um, no, no spotlight shining right into their cages. So the initial interactions. Um, in your organization, it's really important to decide if you're going to be trying to tame tiny tigers that you have protocols in place of who is allowed to handle them. Um, and you may have to do a bit of an assessment to figure that out first and see how um, potentially dangerous they might be. Are they willing to strike? Are they willing to bite? Um, and having really staff members only work with them until we know that they've come, that the kittens have calmed down a bit, and perhaps you're very well trained volunteers who have had some training specifically for working with these kind of kittens are then able to work with them, and then eventually the plan is like anyone should be able to be with them, including children, um, as they progress. So the, um, the other thing to consider is when they first come in, they're terrified, and sometimes aggression is because out of fear, and it's not just it's not their nature to be aggressive. They're just scared out of their minds. They're they're in a totally different environment, new sounds, sights, smells. They don't know what's going on. So make sure that everyone who is working with those kittens, everyone who's going in and out of those rooms where those kittens are being held, are talking softly. They're moving very slowly because the kittens are feeling like prey right now and, and slow moving predators are a lot easier to get away from and not so threatening as fast moving predators. So let's slow down our movements, let's soften our voice, let's soften the lighting and cages are awful loud and clunky. Can we just you know latch the cages and not slam them um, and not yell across the room, hey, can you grab me a bowl? You know, nice and calm, let these kittens calm down. Avoid direct eye contact. It could be really threatening to them, and it's threatening to us if someone comes up to us and is like, you know, what are you doing? So, you know, we don't want to do that to them. And when you do have to handle them, a gentle but firm handling. Um, you have to remember they may try to escape, so you need enough firmness in the handling, certainly using gloves uh, if that is the, uh, if it's initial handling. And, and your gloves at your places, they're not one size fits all. So please don't put like tiny hands in these monster sized gloves because, okay, yeah, you're probably gonna not get bit as easily because you got these monster sized gloves on, but 
you also can't handle the animal as well either because you can't feel what you're doing. You got this, you know, all this extra material around you. So small, medium, and large are there for a reason. And don't forget the people with monster hands like me. Please get them some large ones as well. Um, do a quick look at them. We're not going to subject them to a full palpation and exam, but we just want to at least take a quick look at them to make sure that they're um, otherwise safe and healthy. Sometimes, sadly, traps um, you know, get thrown in the back of pickup trucks and they get bent and, and damaged a bit. And I've seen some just horrible things of you know, when the cats have been trapped in their trap, their humane trap that has wires that are loose and they're getting lacerated or punctured with every scary turn that they have in that cage, please make sure that those humane traps truly are humane before you send them out. And then, of course, check the animals when they come in to make sure there has not been any injury to them. And then give them some quiet time. Just let them chill. Even if they're like this guy. Well, this guy's going to be really easy. But, you know, even if it's a six-week-old kitten who's looking, okay, just let them chill for a bit. Give them, give them four or five hours, just chill. Okay, so the housing, um, if you can put them in a cage that's at least waist high or maybe a little bit higher, the altitude, the height of that cage is gonna help them out to be able to, think about your own cats at home, where do they wanna be? They kind of want to be up a little bit higher. They want to be able to see what's going on. They don't want to just see feet going by. They want to know like what's connected to those feet. Um, and so if they can start to look out of their cage and see their environment a little bit from up here, that's very helpful to them. And then likewise, when we're working with them, we can take a seat and then we're all of a sudden more at their height. And rather than having to crawl onto the floor for a lower cage. As the kitten progresses, we're gonna go ahead and give them some perks and some extra space, but we don't wanna do too much of that right away because a lot of times what's gonna happen is you do have to get in there to handle the kitten. They've got extra places to jump back and forth to. And, they, and the hammocks and things may be obstacles to you being able to get to the kitten and do what you need to do. And I'll show you some pictures in a little bit about that. Similarly, um, if you don't have Cages, you can do this, um, this taming in a small bathroom. Think about disinfecting and think about safety. And um, you know, a tile bathroom is a lot easier to disinfect than a, a bedroom with linens on the bed and curtains on the wall. Um, because if these kittens do get sick, you're gonna need to do some pretty serious disinfecting and not all linens and, and carpeting will take that. So think about that as you're um, housing them. And if you are going to house them in a bathroom, please make sure you kitten-proof it. Toilet seat down, the, lo the lid down. Um, pretty much everything out of there. Um, if there's things on, sh on shelves, on the back of the toilet, if there's a cabinet underneath the sink that has cleaning supplies or whatever's in there, they will learn how to open up that door just to figure out what the heck is behind there. So just like child-proofing a, a room, let's do that for the kitties also and keep them safe. So some interactions then. There's a, a picture. This cage is getting a little bit more set up. Um, this kitty's been here for a little bit. He's, he's made some progress. Uh, and he's got a bed there. He's got his litter box. Notice there's a plastic container around the litter box that also helps keep litter in, but it can also serve as a perch for him to hop up on. The little toy that's hanging there, that's just a baby toy. Um, you can even play in, buy us, it's like two for five bucks. It has a little tiny rattle in there. And what I love, so kittens won't initially play in front of you. They won't, probably won't initially eat in front of you. Um, but this little guy loved this because I would leave the room and I would hear jingle, 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 jingle. <laughs> he's starting to play. He won't do it in front of me yet, but he's starting to play. Um, so this is one of my favorite things. Be the source of all things good. Just like we heard earlier about play groups and some of those dogs who had to be pick, picked up and physically carried out and they were scared out of their minds at first and they didn't know if they should trust the humans, um, but then they started to realize, wow, that human comes and gets me, I get to go play. The human comes to visit me, says the tiny kitten. Says I'm getting in their minds. 
the tiny kitten says, wow, I get food, I get really good food, I get treats, I get wet food, um, I get baby food, some really high uh, reward kind of treats, and, um, and, then, and then later on I'll get toys. So you are the source of all things good. When you leave, the food leaves with you, the toys leave with you until they progress to like this guy has to be able to have those toys with you. Obviously they need to have enough food and water. The water's always there. They obviously need to have enough water, food every day. So we're not saying starve the kittens. Um, and, and certainly in the beginning, there may be, you may just have to leave the kibble in there because they're too afraid to eat. And so certainly you need to do that. But when you start doing the higher reward food, the wet food, or like I said, the human baby food, um, that's how we can move forward with that. Increase the sounds, the voices, radios, those kind of things as they continue to regress. And be patient um, and be prepared. Don't go in there if you are stressed. Take off the stresses of your day first and then go in and try to work with the kitties. So the other thing is um, looking towards short visits per versus long visits. Having many short visits instead of one long visit during the day is going to be more important uh, or more useful moving the kittens along. As the kittens do what you want them to do, for example, they didn't hiss at you, you give them a reward. Reward the, beho reward the positive behavior. Um, if you are able to set your, your hand next to them on the, where, the area where they're sitting and they didn't strike you or they didn't pull back from you, you give them a reward. That was a good behavior. They didn't run away from you. Uh, always reward the positive behaviors. Eventually start decreasing the hiding spots if all they're doing is hiding in them. In the beginning, you'll see they don't like to use their bedding. They'd rather hide behind their bedding than lay on it. And that's another sign of success when they're willing to hang out in their beds. Of course, the safety concerns, uh, wearing gloves. You could have some stand-in items. Um, baby kittens, you can use a toothbrush on, even just for regular care for them to simulate the mother cat licking them. You can maybe use a toothbrush as an extension to try to first touch their side. Don't go straight on on their faces. Try to get to the side first um, and find that sweet spot. If you get a kitten who, you know, you kind of get to here, you've started on their side and you kind of get to, to here and the kitten is like, oh, and it pushes its head into you a little bit and then sometimes it'll go, nope, 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 I don't like that. But it's like, ah, I know you liked it. And, you know, a little bit here, uh, that's a sign that kitten is going to come around. Maybe lift their chin up when you, when you stroke them there. Um, those are really good signs. Again, just keep rewarding that positive behavior. So here's the thing, people look at me a little crazy when I do this, and actually the kittens look at me a little crazy, but I swear to God it works every single time. Um, so you've got your kitten in there, you've, you've slowly been working towards being able to touch them. Once you're able to touch their side, so there he is, it's in there, just get underneath them, pick them up, put them down, just like that, boop, boop, like a few inches, boop, boop. and at first they're like, Ugh. okay, I'm down, give him a treat. Pick them up, put them down, give them a treat. Pick them up, put them down, give them a treat. I'm like, what the heck are you doing? They got it, right? So you pick them up, and you hold them for a couple seconds. <gasps> Wait, I didn't get to put down. Pick them up, one, two, put them down. Give them a treat. Do it again, give them a treat. Extend that length of, hold that, of time that you're holding them up above the ground, up above their cage space. Give them a treat. Okay, they're like, okay, so you're holding me here. Great, fine. You're crazy, lady. So pick them up, move them a little bit, move them towards the front of the cage, move them back, put them down. You're not taking them out of the cage, you're not going, okay, you are gonna sit on my lap on day two. Give them some time. Pick them up, move them forward, move them back, maybe hold them a second or two, put them down. Treat after every single time. Reward that positive behavior that they didn't go crazy. And they will look at you eventually like you are crazy because like, okay, what are you doing? You keep picking me up and putting me down. Putting me, stop it already. So eventually you get to the point where you can be sitting in front of their cage and you pick them up and you move them and you put them down oh, on your lap. Oh my God. Be ready that they might want to <laughs> jump away. But if you've done this enough times and you're sitting literally right in front of their cage, they're okay. And when they do jump away, most of the time they're gonna jump back into their cage rather than onto the floor of some unknown environment. So that is really a huge thing to be able to do um, to get them used to picking them up and moving them. And you just keep extending the amount of time, the amount of distance, eventually you can move further from the cage and then come back again and treat. A reward, a reward, a reward every time. Eventually we don't wanna treat more than 
10% of their body of their food every way, every day, but um, for now we can reward them that much. Okay. Oh, heaven's sakes, what just happened? We got a sticky clicker. Okay. Um, introducing them to new sounds and sights and stimuli. If we don't um, have sirens readily available, our cell phones do. Barking dogs readily available, our cell phones do. Uh, all the garbage trucks, our cell phones have them. So you can do sounds with your cell phones. Two things that I find really freak kittens out are ceiling fans and big screen TVs. So if you can slowly introduce them to those concepts, a non-moving ceiling fan, a big screen TV that maybe has a cat program on there, some nature scenes, maybe then some news where maybe they're hearing a little bit of stuff, but don't bring them into a room with a giant 60 inch screen TV that's playing you know, the, the superhero move, movies and they're in the middle of a battle scene. Um, even my, my, feral, my, semi, my former feral cat still freaks out at that a little bit. So introduce them to those kind of things. Of course, we know about vacuum cleaners and that. When we're talking about children, make sure that children are sitting on the floor uh, and the kittens are able to crawl over them and move around as they please. Moving children and moving kittens are a really bad combination at the same time, and kittens tend to get the worst end of that deal when they both try to want to occupy that same point in space. Prepare then um, for vet visits. I was really naive when I first started in the shelter world. Um, I started in um, shelter medicine. And we worked really hard to make sure that we can handle those cats so, because if we couldn't, they didn't have a good outcome. Um, and when I switched to uh, being a, a vet nurse in private practice, I was so naive. I'm like, oh, these animals will be great. They're not going to you know, try to get away. They're, they're owned animals. They'll be great. They're not. They're, they're scared, too, at a vet clinic. So we try to do fear-free with them as well. Um, you can practice positioning them for things that might happen later in their vet visits, like they're going to need a blood draw from their jugular vein or from their leg, and just kind of position them in different ways. I don't know how my clock still says five minutes. <laughs> Is it a 30-minute session? Yeah, OK. Um, I will go fast, though. OK, two minutes. We, we compromised there. <laughs> um, so the signs of progress, the, pa the posture. So here we have this is the same kitten in both photos. Um, in the beginning, you see he is hiding. And this is actually a couple, this is maybe about a week. The first photo is maybe about a week after he came in. And, and he's hiding still behind his bedding. But as they progress, they, they tend to relax more. They'll lay on their side. They'll keep their paws out rather, or keep the, they'll tuck their paws under rather, rather than having them out and ready to strike. Um, they will be able to sleep in your presence. They will be able and willing to eat in your presence and play in your presence. Um, all of those things, as those are happening, you know you're, you're um, progressing. There he is in his hammock. He's won a hammock. He's won an extra toy. You notice his eyes are bright. His ears are up. He's a much happier kitty now. When they are purring and greeting you, coming to the front of the cage, clicker training a whole other session would be awesome. Clicker train with these guys. Get them to come to the front of the cage. Um, it helps really with adoption, too. Lots of great stuff. Sometimes you need to do some tough love, like those kittens in the beginning. They all transform just fine. But that one who was really scared, with older kittens, if you find that you know, you have two or three who have come around. They're great. You can handle them. You can do everything you need to with them. But you're waiting for the third sibling to come around. But those guys are ready for adoption. Sometimes you need to let the two that are ready to go to adoption and then keep working with the third one rather than um, holding everyone up. Or sometimes you can separate that third one into its own cage and still have um, sight of each other in the other cages. And then that other one has to just kind of learn that um, it needs to rely on itself, and, and it can't hide behind its siblings all the time. Similarly, you can continue on. Um, they can sometimes be adopted out when they're kind of, you know, halfway tamed. But please make sure if you're going to do that, your adopters know that they need to continue working with the kitty. Maybe if you have a behaviorist on staff who can kind of check in with them, because if they don't continue working with the kitty until it truly is social to them and, and hopefully to other people as well, um, they might just regress a little bit. So again, each kitten is different. Um, we want to have um, between that two weeks and two months is optimal. It doesn't mean that it can't happen otherwise, but it will usually take longer. Um, start slowly. Be sure to be aware of safety for both the humans and the kitties. 
Be the source of all things good. The food, the toys, everything that is good is there when you are there and it's not there when you're not. Other than, of course, food in the beginning, which you can't deny them that. Um, reward the positive behavior, slowly increase the stimuli, be patient and flexible. And if they're not gonna transform, have the option to be able to send them to a farm, a, a barn situation, back to the colony they came from, um, or a working cat situation in a warehouse or something like that. Thank you very much, Tiny Tamed Tigresses. Thank you. <laughs>